everyone. My name is Sonia Sabiki. I am the Texas People's Tribunal Coordinator and the Teach-In Coordinator for If I Must Die, You Must Live, an international teach-in on war, the death penalty, political imprisonment, and the Palestinian genocide. Thank you all for joining us tonight. On October 9th, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant issued a complete siege on Gaza, blocking the supply of electricity, food, water, and fuel from reaching Palestinians confined to one of the most densely populated places on earth and the world's largest concentration camp. Israel's use of lethal violence against the Palestinians has been relentless. In less than three months, Israel has murdered at least 22,000 people in Gaza. This estimate does not include the number of bodies trapped underneath the rubble. In the West Bank and East Jerusalem, Israeli forces are intensifying lethal operations against Palestinians. The United States is, fa is facilitating the Palestinian genocide by supplying Israel with lethal technologies needed to systematically annihilate Palestinians. At the same time, we are constantly coming into contact with discourse that minimizes, reduces, and disappears what is happening at this moment. We have read articles that refer to Palestinian child prisoners as people aged 18 and younger, and the headlines that refer to Israeli forces forcing the evacuation of Al Nasser Hospital and leaving behind premature babies to die as fragile lives found ended in evacuated Gaza Hospital. In Western media, Palestinian deaths are not described as killings or murder. Palestinians just stop existing. In the US left, we see fractions regarding the Palestinian struggle. Some support the liberation of Palestine but not the process of achieving liberation. Others support an end to Israeli occupation, but the maintenance of settler colonialism. These issues are not new. I was an undergraduate student when Israel launched Operation Protective Edge in 2014. This military operation lasted one month, two weeks, and four days. Israel murdered an estimated 2,310 Palestinians. The events that took place were characterized as a conflict. Palestinian homes that had been bombed by Israel were simply described as uninhabitable. Towns that were destroyed because of Israeli aggression were merely unlivable. I remember thinking, what caused these conditions? Why are there sections of Gaza that can no longer support life? When Israel formally initiated this genocide, the Texas People's Tribunal issued a statement in solidarity with the people of Palestine. We unequivocally support their right to self-determination, self-defense, and life. While drafting the statement, we began to consider a few questions. For those of us residing in the West, how can we effectively organize against genocide? What role do people in the U.S. Republic play against U.S. imperialism? And the Palestinians are forging their path towards liberation. How can we be in solidarity with their struggle? This three-part program was born out of our desire to connect with others who strive to answer these questions, to foster community and build sustainable movements. We want to initiate this initiative by learning the language and gaining the knowledge that accurately communicates past and present material conditions that have been imposed on the Palestinian people and how the Palestinians have resisted repression. How were Israel and Palestine's borders created? What do we mean when we say Israel is a settler colonial project? What methods have Palestinians used to act against the colonization of their homeland? 
We aim to explore these and related topics during tonight's event. Thank you to critical geographer and expert on Israel and Palestine's borders, Dr. Linda Kikivish, and sociologist activist, Dr. Mohanand Ayash, who was born and raised in Silwan Al Quds, for sharing your insight and knowledge during tonight's program. Thank you to Texas People's Tribunal Communications Director and Prisoner Solidarity Committee Co-Chair, Marinda Chrisman, for facilitating tonight's panel discussion. And thank you to International Peace Research Association Secretary General and Spirit of Mandela Coordinating Committee Member, Matt Meyer, for opening tonight's program with me. Thank you to Missourians to abolish the death penalty, Activist News Network, Spirit of Mandela Coalition, the People Senate, Jericho Movement, and International Peace Research Association for accepting our invitation to co-sponsor this initiative. And thank you to Marinda and Missourians to abolish the death penalty co-director, Michelle Smith, for being a part of the court organizing committee. Thank you to our social media manager, Miranda Uribe, and our graphic design specialist, Precious Onalaja for leading the outreach efforts. And thank you to Activist News Network for live streaming this event. We dedicate this program to the Palestinian diaspora, to people who are targets of genocide in Sudan, the US Republic, Kashmir, the Congo, Balochistan, and elsewhere in the world. We dedicate this program to Palestinians in Palestine, to those who have been murdered and martyred, and to those who are to those who are alive and to those who are in spaces that are somewhere in between. I'd like to end my segment with Dr. Rifayat al arirs poem, If I Must Die. As you all may know, the quoted words in our program title come from his poem. Dr. al arir was murdered by an Israeli airstrike on December 7th along with his brother, his sister, and her four children. His work gives us courage. If I must die, you must live. To tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite you made, flying up above and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. I want to reiterate the points made in our October 19th statement. Israel is an apartheid state. Israel is committing genocide against the people of Palestine. Solidarity with the Palestinian people. I'll now turn it over to Matt. Hmm. Well, since um... We're doing thank yous. It's worth uh, thanking Tanya Siddiqui uh, and our sisters and brothers in Texas for initiating this time together. Uh, as she said, my name is Matt Meyer. I'm the Secretary General of the International Peace Research Association. And we believe that anyone in the world who uh, says they're in favor of peace uh, has to stand with the people of Palestine for an end to apartheid uh, Israel and settler colonialism. But really, uh, as part of the coordinating committee of the Spirit of Mandela Coalition, uh, for us, it's important to reference that we came together principally just a couple of years ago and helped to host in 2021 the International Tribunal that uh, 70 years after the great Pan-Africanist W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and William Patterson and many others uh, charged the U.S. with genocide against its Black populations and, and, and other peoples. Uh, 
uh, 70 years later in 2021, we said we still charge genocide and we helped convene an international tribunal with uh, jurists from South Africa, India, Eritrea, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and the US uh, to review charges that eventually led to a finding of a guilty verdict. US guilty of five counts of significant human rights abuses, ongoing abuses against black, brown, and indigenous peoples in the US uh, to essentially uh, say that genocide continues in a slow and ongoing fashion uh, here in the US. So in raising the question of genocide and how we look at genocide in 21st century terms, it's essential and important to therefore look again, uh, especially as an internationalist group with an internationalist view at what is happening in Palestine. So like Texas People's Tribunal, the Spirit of Mandela Coalition also put together a statement, as we've seen hundreds of statements around the world in solidarity with the people of Palestine. And so this webinar in many ways for us makes the perfect link uh, the way of saying that we come together as a global community, as more and more coalitions are building to come together to look at how we can provide uh, more intense, stauncher, a dedicated solidarity to the people of Palestine at this time, to stop the genocide, but also to call for a total end to settler colonialism, to Israel's apartheid, and for liberation total liberation of the people of Palestine. We recognize in this context that Palestine is part of many still occupied peoples. So as we look at Palestine, we also think about Kashmir, West Papua, Western Sahara, Puerto Rico, uh, and other still occupied people. But the genocide that is so obviously and clearly taking place in Gaza today, a much heightened and sped up genocide that's part of its own 70 years of, of occupation and, uh, and apartheid uh, is the world's emergency at this moment. I think uh, it's also important for me to say that as a person born of Jewish descent in New York City, uh, still based in New York City, we are at a moment where we are actually and essentially seeing something different. More and more within Israel and around the world, and even in the backwaters of the United States, there are people, younger people, it's a generational thing for sure, people of Jewish descent saying Israel does not represent us, not in our name. And in fact, Israel is, as has long been understood by peoples of African descent, and of course, by the Palestinian people, it is an apartheid regime. That's not just rhetoric. It is a regime that has to end because Zionism is racism and Zionism represents something that cannot be in accordance with international human rights. So finally, I want to say, as someone who was a part as a young person, as a youth, of the movement against apartheid in South Africa, Spirit of Mandela and our organized grouping People's Senate, which the, uh, the Texas uh, People's Tribunal is, is a part of, the building of a national People's Senate. We take our name from Mandela and not just Nelson, but all of the Mandelas, um, because there's a certain inspiration about what happened in the 1980s and 90s in that part of the world. When we were beginning to build our part of the generational movement in the late 70s and early 80s, it seemed that South Africa might never be free in our lifetime, that apartheid might never end, that if it did end, it would only end with a tremendous, tremendous bloodbath, even greater than what we're seeing today in Gaza. And it was quite an extraordinary reality 
to notice that we were wrong. And we were wrong because of the organization of people in South Africa, Azania, and the international solidarity that we were able to mobilize. Now is the time to do the same thing through boycott divestment, through isolation, through the support of new groupings. We just saw uh, a major announcement yesterday uh, put out by friends of ours in the Black Alliance for Peace of an international coalition of human rights and anti-war organizations to demand an end to genocide in Palestine. So we join with Ajamu Baraka and Lamy Steek and our friends in that coalition to say we can, we must build a movement like we did in the 1980s, taking the leadership of Palestinian resistance at the fore and saying that we will support solidarity to isolate Israel until the Israeli apartheid regime, until Zionism is no more. Thank you. And I can't wait to hear our key speakers coming up just now. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you to everyone here. Thank you for this gathering. Um, in really in really dark times, it's really important to, to be together and try to think through precisely the spirit of this gathering is how do we organize from here? What do we do? There's been a lot of unveiling that has got, that has taken place about the world. And what I'm going to present today, what it will be my offering, um, is a look at that world that is informed from 500 years of struggle back to 1492. Um, and before I do that, I want to just especially send uh, an embrace to you, Mohammed Ayash, um, and your people, the people of the wheat, the people of the olive trees, from the people of the maize. Um, I'm a geographer, and what I do is I, I look at borders, I look at the way that society is organized through space. Uh, one of my... Um, obsessions for a very long time has been borders because my family has been forced to cross them. And ancestrally on these lands, borders didn't exist and now they're everywhere. And they cause a lot of death, pain and destruction. And I was studying geography. I was doing a doctorate in geography when I first turned to Palestine. My doctorate was going to look at the Mexico-Guatemala border where my ancestral lands are, my grandparents' lands and communities were cut into between Mexico, the state of Mexico, and the state of Guatemala. So as I started to learn about Palestine, I couldn't stop looking. I couldn't stop turning my gaze to especially Rafah Crossing and, and Gaza. And that led me to this whole journey of looking at maps and inspecting how it is that our geographical imaginations are created through maps. And then um, those, those imaginations, many of them quite unsavory, are then forcefully implemented on the ground with violence. So um, looking at a world map, I think it's important to look at how I, the idea of the world has shifted especially in the geographic imagination of Europe, because with 1492, uh, we get a shift in the understanding of the world. There's a creation of a new map. But prior to 1492, the world in the European imagination was three continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, and in the center, it's Jerusalem. And this is important to, to, to recognize in particular because Europe and Asia are not two continents. They're, they're one great landmass called Eurasia. But in the European imagination, Europe is its own place, it's its own continent. And so it has created this division, uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And actually this map is um, a, a replica of it, even though it's 
from 1581, shortly after 1492. And you can tell because there's this blob of territory down here, which is us, uh, which they would call the Americas. It didn't fit into the world map, uh, but the center of the world as Jerusalem is still persistent in the European imagination and in particular in the Zionist imagination. There's a replica of this map in Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem, um, that that was erected as small tiles um, by the Zionist movement. So important to know sacred kind of geography and how different it is if we just look uh, at a contemporary map that shows Jerusalem. This is a proposed state of Palestine. It's uh, there's no state of Palestine. This is a proposed state of Palestine with Jerusalem as its capital. And it doesn't look so sacred there. Um, it's got the same font size as Tel Aviv and Amman. And so it's really difficult to, in using this kind of map, which is the, the dominant map, kind of the only way that we really are introduced to maps today. It's, it's important to understand that this takes away from the understanding of a sacred place. Jerusalem is not just sacred for Europeans, for Christians, and Europeans have mapped Christianity onto uh, European identity since the beginning. It's also an important sacred place for Judaism, as we know, and of course, Islam. And so when we hear about Jerusalem and with this question of Palestine, it's really important to understand that uh, Jerusalem is not just any place. Palestinians have been guardians of Jerusalem, allowing Jews, Christians, Muslims, everyone of, of, of their faiths to coexist, which has had been also the case in Europe, uh, especially in the Iberian Peninsula on the eve of 1492. But 1492 then ethnically cleansed Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula to create this idea of Europe. So. Uh, important to understand then that this doesn't really get at, at this question of Jerusalem. So um, if you notice, it's not really discussed, but um, Al-Aqsa, we are in a situation right now where we need to recognize how important Al-Aqsa is for the Palestinian movement, the role of Islam. A lot of our movements tend to secularize Palestine. But on the ground, it's it's not very it's not secular. It's very spiritual, and that doesn't mean that this is, you know, not about religion. It is about religion. I think that often we say that because we don't want to uh, be understood as saying that X religion is wrong and Y religion is correct. No, um, it is about religion, and it's not about pick, about us picking which religion is correct. Um, but it is still a very spiritual struggle. As, as, as it is material. Uh, I wanna show this map too, which is related to this one. This, this map of the three continents, it's, its precursor is the TNO map, um, which has the three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And, again, and this is from the seventh century. And what it does is it, it creates Europe as separate from Asia, and it, it divides the world into these three continents with the Mediterranean and the Nile. And, and then there's like an O of ocean, so a T and O map. And notice that this map maps on a biblical story. Here you see Shem, um, Ham, and Japheth. This biblical story uh, is from the tale of, of Noah's Ark and Noah's three sons. Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is, 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 is known as the cursed son. Europe's maps have mapped on Ham onto Africa, cursing Africa, and Shem onto Asia, which is where Semitic comes from. So when Europeans are calling Jews in Europe, Semites, it is to relegate them over to Asia. They don't belong in Europe. So this whole term of anti-Semitic, it's, it's a very strange history, a, a very racist history as well. 
because it's connected to this curse of Ham. So Europe's geographic imagination has been that Africa, which is so close to Europe and the Iberian Peninsula is right at the border between this construction of, of Europe and the continent of Africa. And so European identity has been created as a, a negative, as, as a referent of the positive to the negative of Africa and uh, Asia being over in the West, closer to heaven, closer to where the Holy Land is. So important to understand that this is the prehistory of modern Europe. Now, modern Europe likes to call itself secular, but um, there are still a lot of these remnants from uh, the medieval imagination. And I want to um, have us focus on Europe, on this construction of Europe. Europe, for many scholars, the birth of modern Europe comes either at 1492, when the Europeans found our lands here, or um, in 1453, when the Roman Empire fell. Um, it was already crumbling, disintegrating, and in 1453, the Ottoman Empire took Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul. And so from the East, for the European imagination from the East, there was Islam, and it was um, a very, a very frightful, very scary uh, civilization, very powerful, so still very much respected in that way. But on the East, it felt for Europe, for Europe, for Christendom in particular, that uh, the Muslims were coming. And so while that was happening in the East, on the West. A something of a miracle, as I understood, was happening where the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula were being pushed out. And on January 2nd, 1492, before October 12th, that same year, and on the same Iberian Peninsula, on January 2nd, 1492, Granada, which was the last Muslim stronghold of the Iberian Peninsula after having a civilization there for centuries, on January 2nd, 1492, uh, the Islamic Iberian Peninsula was no more. And this was Queen Isabella who financed Columbus's trip over this way and their conversation about his trip because he was actually in Granada waiting for Granada to surrender before he would you know, have a conversation with Isabella and they would talk about how they can get Jerusalem next. So remember in the geographic imagination of Europe, what Jerusalem means, right? It's the center of the world. So after taking Granada, Isabella and Columbus's scheme was to take Jerusalem next, but by sailing west, because over in the east were the Ottomans, the Mamluks, uh, Muslims, Islam. So when Columbus reaches these lands, reaches the Caribbean, uh, encounters immediately enslaves and begins a genocidal campaign against the Taino people in 1492. He returns to Portugal with some enslaved Taino people with him. And the Portuguese find out that there are these new territories. Um, they don't necessarily know that it's a new quote unquote world, but the Portuguese want in on these spoils. And so the Portuguese and the other Catholic monarchs of the Iberian Peninsula who become the Spanish, so Isabella and Ferdinand, uh, they start to fight. And so the, the Pope steps in because he does not want them to fight. And eventually, um, very, very quickly, actually in 1493, you start, they start to draw a line. This is a... Um, a map of the of the world. They didn't have it this way before. They didn't understand. They didn't know that all of these territories were here yet in the so-called Americas. In 1450, in 1493, they start drawing a line, and then again in 1494, that says that everything east of this line, Portugal can go invade, and everything west of this line, the Spanish can invade. Which is why here, where um, is modern day Brazil? that line cut right there. And so in Brazil, we speak, uh, they speak Portuguese and over on the Western side, Spanish is spoken. So it's 
uh, an invasion and a conversion of the world. Notice that um, the languages that we now speak, it, whether it's Portuguese, Spanish, English, or French, some variants of French, help, those were imposed on the peoples here. And our worlds were not respected. Our languages were not respected. We were all forced to convert uh, to Catholicism. And if we did not, then we would be killed. We would get the same treatment that Jews got in Spain if it was suspected that the ones who converted were actually lying. There's an, there was an exhibit of the Inquisition's torture methods when I visited Granada a couple of years ago that reminded me so much of what our peoples have gone through here, uh, waterboarding, the burning of our books, the burning of the Maya books, for example. There are only four left in existence that we know of. And that had also happened internally to Europe. Um, so a lot of the atrocities that were inflicted on us here, Europe was inflicting internally within already people already in Europe. And even to this day, there's a Europe from below and a Europe from above. There's still people in Europe who understand themselves as indigenous. They don't want to be this homogenized white Western way uh, of being. Uh, they want to keep living their lives. They defend the land. But what happens here is that all of us are now forced to live in one world. Our worlds are not respected. Of course, there's still many worlds in the Americas, like there are in many parts of the world. We've been fighting to keep them alive, and we're still fighting 500 years later. But this logic of then cutting up the line is really a contract between invaders, a contract between colonizers who treat the land as an object to exploit, to extract from. And so none of these um, communities get consulted or get asked or are part of this. Um, today, there's these cons consultations that states um, perform with native peoples here to sell concessions for mining extraction to whether it's the United States or China. But the, the land is still treated as a plantation with nation states. So this is the prehistory of the border that we get to after this immediately Abi Ayala, Turtle Island starts getting cut up into vice royalties, the vice royalty Brazil, Rio de la Plata. The first one was New Spain, which becomes Mexico and New Granada and Peru. So again, the logic of cutting up the world. From above, and at this moment, cartographers are even talking about themselves as, you know, kind of playing God and not at all respecting the below, not respecting the land, not respecting life. After this happens here in our lands, in Africa, this happens as well. This happens in the late 19th century, the 1880s, and it happens in Europe. There is a wall map of Africa put up, it's hosted in Berlin by the Germans. Germany had just been created as a nation state in 1870. And it wanted to get into the game of empire as well. So it called its contemporary empires, Britain, France, Belgium, all of the, uh, there's Italy who participated, Portugal. Um, and they decided how they were gonna cut up Africa. And it was a moment by the late 19th century, it's a moment where they're just grabbing as much land as they, as they possibly can, not knowing what ends up being there, and of course, the Congo gets gifted by Europeans to a single European, King Leopold II, who treats the Congo as his personal rubber plantation. And of course, now we know the Congo is still understood as a plantation. And the act of genocide there is the people getting in the way of what capital wants from the Congo. So we have the vice royalties, the land cut up here, we have the land then cut up in Africa. And then a couple of decades later, it happens in Palestine, which is in red, and also the neighboring areas. This, this had been land that had been under the dominion of the Ottoman Empire. And at this moment, this is the Sykes-Picot Agreement, a secret agreement between the British and the French and the Russians and other Europeans 
over how the Ottoman territories were going to be divided among the powers in Europe, which had been a source of anxiety for the Europeans for about a hundred years because it was understood that the Ottoman Empire was falling. And so they were salivating over the territories. Who was going to get what? And how was that going to shift the power imbalance uh, in Europe or the current power balance, right? And so we see here in the top here, France has um, decided it wants control of this area, which becomes Syria and Lebanon. Uh, the British want control from Palestine to what becomes Iraq and Kuwait, understanding that there is oil here. And um, they say that Palestine is going to be international, international meaning just them, you know, the, Rus the Russians, the British and the French. And if you look a little bit closely, more closely over where Palestine is, you can see there's a little bit of over on where is Akka today, there's a port on the Mediterranean right above the letter N of Palestine that is a lighter pink. That was to be all under British rule or a pipeline from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean Sea, which Netanyahu was at the United Nations on September 22nd with a map like this taking Palestine off the map and saying, we're gonna finally build this pipeline. So what I want to um, have as a takeaway with this understanding of the world getting cut up into borders is that there is a, a realm of above where international law functions of who it's for and borders are part of international law and it's for the rulers. It is not for the below. It's not for the worlds down here. For the peoples here, it does not respect the land. It understands land and life is just objects. And it's gotten so much worse with capital that kind of makes it be so normalized in everyone's everyday lives, being forced to live with capitalism now, since many of us don't know how to live without it, even though we may be anti-capitalist. Something that's really important to know in the prehistory of how Palestine gets these borders is that the shape of Palestine before the Sykes-Picot Agreement, how does the Sykes-Picot Agreement even get this shape, right? Because this is Bilad Shams. None of these borders existed. There was a lot of travel and um, a lot of families that got cut by these borders. But how does Palestine get that shape? It happened, so this is uh, 1916. It happens in the 1860s and 70s um, with this map, map of Western Palestine, which is a map that was created by the British, British scholars, British evangelicals, and the British engineers, the British military. While this is still under the reign of the Ottoman Empire, they go in to what is today uh, the territory of Palestine, they go to Belad Shams, and they start mapping what they understand to be the promised land or the holy land, according to the book of Joshua. It's a very genocidal book, actually, um, in the Bible that uh, talks about what land God gave to the Israelites. And notice that it says Western Palestine. The For these evangelicals, the Holy Land, Palestine should really have been a lot, um, it should have expanded more east toward the Euphrates and the Tigris of modern day Iraq. And so they called it Western Palestine because they had joined up with the US American evangelicals who also wanted to map, but they weren't very good cartographers, very good surveyors. And so um, the British knew this. And so they gave the US Americans everything to the east of the River Jordan. Here's the River Jordan. Here's the sea. So from the river to the sea. But the River Jordan, east of the River Jordan, was supposed to be mapped by the US Americans. But the US Americans messed up, and that map was not created. And so by that accident of history with the British, uh, which ended up becoming this, this shape, with the British and the French in 1923. So see how the um, prehistory there of how even Palestine gets these borders and it, it comes from the evangelicals together with the British military and the US evangelicals who really believe that this land is theirs. And these are Christians. So Christians 
are the ones that are colonizing this land first. And Zionism ends up kind of being a, a way to join up so that Jews from Europe can come and settle. So what happens after World War I and the Ottoman Empire falls is that Palestine is cut up. So is Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, all of these new nation states are created. And um, immediately the British start to map inside Palestine, mapping the land as private property. So here's a, here's a, sh a little bit, this is Bethlehem. And this is a map from the British uh, colonial administration mapping out the land, like the orchards and as private property. In, so we get Palestine cut up. Uh, we get the world cut up as these plantations, as these uh, domains of rule from the above. And then we get that internally also with mapping land through these cadastres, these private property maps which was so foreign to the ways of doing in Palestine. Um, there's a, I have an essay in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism called When the Carob Tree Was the Border, where I go into more detail about how quote unquote borders were understood between people on the land. And it's very fascinating to look at everyday life to see how people figure things out. So like when we're talking the question of how are we going to organize, we have a lot of wisdom from people on the ground from the below. And just to illustrate, and I'll pass it on over to Mohanid and um, to illustrate how this happens on the eve of 1948, is that before people would ask their neighbors, they would consult with their neighbors over where the border was going to be. It's that carob tree to that carob tree, for example. But then when the British colonized Palestine, they do away with those practices and they implement these cadastro map. Now, if you have a problem with this border, instead of talking to your neighbor, you go to the colonial administration and you ask them to be the intermediary to resolve these problems. So we see there in that shift, how practices of everyday where power is circulating between neighbors and they're the ones that are gonna have to face the consequences of whatever border is decided, right? So they have to look at each other every day. They have to live next to each other. Shouldn't they be the ones that make these decisions? Well, that's the below. The above is this highly bureaucratic central administration that wants to be the intermediary. And so then what that does breaks that practice of building the common together with your neighbor. And it makes it so that people even forget that that's something that we're even capable of. And we go and speak to the above and we ask them to solve our problem. So looking at this question, how do we organize from here when the world is a lie, when they told us that international law is going to prevent a genocide from happening ever again? And we see that it's useless. How do we, how do we relate to international law? How do we use it tactically? How do we how do we create something outside of it so we're not stuck and just asking the above for how we should live our lives? I'll pass it on to you, Hanne. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Kihi, for that excellent uh, presentation and and certainly for your very kind words in the beginning. I'm I'm really thankful for those. Uh, uh, so thank you, and and thank you to. Tanya, Matt, uh, uh, all the organizers uh, for organizing this event. It's an honor to be here and, and to speak with you here today. Um, I, I am speaking to you uh, from the homelands of the uh, uh, Mi'kmaq um, uh, in what is uh, today called in its settler colonial name, uh, the province of Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, uh, these are their homelands. Uh, they have always been their homelands and always will be their homelands. Um, uh, regardless of the Canadian state's colonial attempt to eradicate and eliminate Indigenous sovereignty, I, I hope to do my part to, to one day see uh, Indigenous sovereignty flourish on these lands uh, once again. Um, uh, so um, what, what I'm going to talk about is, is, is a, a little bit more about the Zionist uh, project, Zionist ideology, and, and 1940 onwards, and, and how, 
how we got to where we got and how we can properly, that the only way that we can properly contextualize um, uh, Zionism and the genocide of the Palestinian people is through the concept of um, uh, uh, you know, colonialism and uh, the concept of colonialism and decolonization. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, Kiki did a, a wonderful job laying out the foundations of colonial modernity. Um, uh, you know, basically, uh, in a nutshell, colonial modernity is, is the idea that it's a concept that describes how everything that we take for granted in how we organize socially, politically, economically today in our world, everything from the nation state to, our, to the modes of sovereignty that we have, to uh, capitalism, to international law, to democracy, to modern nationalism, um, uh, they're, they're all shaped by the European colonial project that started in, in 1492 onward. Um, and of course, the, the, the European and, and later would become the Euro-American um, colonial project is not just one project that looks exactly the same everywhere. Of course it doesn't. Uh, uh, there's various um, uh, forms in which that colonial project was carried out. And, you know, we should always uh, pay attention to the differences and the similarities between, you know, direct colonialism, indirect colonialism, settler colonialism, post-colonialism, uh, slavery, um, uh, um, and, and, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, um, uh, all of these are interconnected, though, uh, insofar as they, they share some general features. Um, and, and one of those general features through which we can start to understand Zionist ideology uh, is a specific form of racialization. Uh, what we saw in this European colonial project is the institutionalization of a dehumanizing racialization, uh, meaning that, uh, uh, and this especially starts to, to, to intensify in the 18th and 19th century, this institutionalization of this dehumanization. So the, the, the raci form of the racialization that dehumanizes all non-whites starts from the 1400s. Uh, but, but by the 18th century, it becomes so intensified that it's now institutionalized, meaning, you know, there's academic disciplines and, sci and science, scientific disciplines claiming to have established once and for all, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, factual basis of hierarchy, uh, you know, the, the, the racial hierarchy and why the white people are the right race is superior to all others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that form of dehumanization of all that is non-European and non-white um, uh, is very much uh, part of this uh, story and, and is at the root of the, the emergence of Zionism. So, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, anti-Semitism has, has existed for quite a long time in Europe. Uh, but it, 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 it achieves a different level of, of discrimination when, when that sort of colonial racism and institutionalization of that colonial racism starts to turn inward into Europe. What had been practiced uh, overseas in the colonies starts to appear in a very institutionalized way within Europe. And all of a sudden, European Jews, which were who were as European as any other European, uh, came, became uh, a scapegoated and cast it out of European society as somehow an inferior race that no longer uh, or does not belong, belong to Europe and should not should not be allowed to remain in Europe. Um, um, that you know th this is what uh, 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 um, uh, Césaire called uh, uh, you know the boomerang effect of colonialism uh, of 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 the, the brutal uh, forms of racialization in the colony turning inward into Europe and and then racializing certain uh, groups within Europe as racially inferior as subhuman as as not deserving of any rights or consideration as human beings and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, as that began to intensify, we saw the emergence of this uh, ideology called the Zionist movement, um, largely in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, the sort of foundational um, logic of the Zionist movement is that European Jews should leave Europe. That the, 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 there is no future for them in Europe, precisely because Europe will never accept them as equals, and precisely because this form of uh, dehumanization is quite dangerous and, and has already had led to, to, to devastating consequences by the uh, 1800s and into the early 1900s, long before the Holocaust. And, um, and of course, it, it reaches its zenith in the Holocaust. 
but it, it, there was already devastating consequences. So, you know, it's understandable that they were like, well, we need to do something. Um, uh, but the problem with the Zionist movement is that it said, well, the solution is to replicate this uh, uh, form of racism outside of Europe. That, that, that will only, you know, the, the Jewish community in Europe will only be accepted as achieving the status of human beings in Europe if they actually leave and colonize the quote unquote Orient. So they didn't oppose that form of racism by, you know, saying, well, let's align ourselves with the colonized world, you know, let's 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 resist this in some way. Um, uh, um, by staying on our lands and refusing to go and and, and um, refusing this this form of racialization, this uh, um, you know baseless uh, 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 be, these baseless assertions of 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 Jews being an inferior race and all of that crazy racist nonsense, um, they they instead said let's join the the colonial European project and let's build a colony. And let's build a state that looks like these European states. And then that way will become accepted as equals to Europe. Um, so, so right there, by, by making that decision, Zionism becomes racist and settler colonial before it even starts to embark on a colonial project in the land of Palestine. Uh, because it had already now adopted that logic in that way of thinking, that there is such a thing as a hierarchy of races, that um, uh, that they were somehow, you know, not deserving to be in Europe and that they have the right to go and colonize the so-called Orient, brown and, or black people at the time. It wasn't decided yet that it was pa Palestine, Uganda was considered, um, um, that they could colonize those people because they're backward savages anyway. So we can just remove them from their land the way that other European empires have been for already at this point uh, uh, hundreds of years. Um, so, so right away, um, uh, uh, like I said, before it actually starts, it, it, it is at its foundation, was, was destined to repeat uh, uh, colonialism because it was part of the colonial modernity, it was part of the colonial European project. And, and, and they knew this because they knew that the land was inhabited. This whole land uh, without a people for a people without land was a myth, and the people knew it was a myth. Um, you know, the people who were leading the Zionist movement knew it was a myth. They knew it was populated. They knew there were Palestinians there, and they knew that the Palestinians had a sovereign relationship to their land, um, and that we're not going to just go, oh, yeah, okay, let's leave our land and give it to you. Like, they knew that that wasn't going to happen, um, uh, and, and they knew that they would have to expel them from their land in order to create this uh, Jewish state that would be a replica of European states and therefore become as equals to Europe and, you know, enter the status of human civilization and all of that other racist colonial nonsense. Um, so, so that's the, the, those are the foundations. Now, uh, um, uh, as they start to arrive in Palestine in larger and larger numbers, uh, Palestinians were already being expelled from their land as far back as the 1920s. Uh, but even before that, in the 1910s, right, when Balfour made the declaration, there were already uh, uh, Palestinian Falahin, uh, you know, uh, loosely uh, translated into the peasantry, uh, were already saying, hey, look, these Zionist organizations are kicking us off, kicking us off our lands. This is well, what's going on here. Something's, this is not just some uh, you know, business deal that they're buying this land and 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 we get to stay on it as has happened for centuries. Um, um, they're buying the land and kicking us off of it. Something's not right here. So, um, uh, you know, this this intensifies in the 1920s and the 1930s. There was the, the the Arab revolt against the British and Zionist colonization, and then but it all culminates in 1948 with the with the settler colonial war of conquest at the end of the British mandate. Uh, when um, uh, uh, approximately 55% of the Palestinian population was expelled from their lands uh, and never never allowed to return and and and, and are still refugees to this day, uh, and that's when we have the uh, 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 creation of the Israeli state. And 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, Zionists love to conceal this reality, and they'll use all sorts of talking points to conceal genocide and ethnic cleansing. Uh, but I don't need to go through that because you're seeing the exact same techniques for concealing genocide today. Uh, so, so we'll talk, you know, whatever we'll talk about in terms of today, uh, same, same techniques were concealing what they were actually doing uh, uh, back in 1948 as well. Uh, 
Uh, but but the, the the whole project was was designed in such a way where it, they understood, like I said, that they had to expel the native Palestinians, remove them from their land, and replace uh, European Jewish settlers. And of course, after 1948, then you start to have um, uh, Arab. Um, uh, Jewish uh, Jewish populations in across the Arab world who had lived there for centuries and were again just as Iraqi as any other Iraqi or just as Yemeni as any other Yemeni or just as Moroccan as any other Moroccan, Algerian, Egyptian, you name it. Uh, all of a sudden, life becomes impossible for them uh, uh, there because of the creation of the Israeli state and the expulsion of Palestinians and the, the you know the the the. Um, the settler colonial war of conquest and 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 um some leave uh, some are forced to leave by the arab governments um um uh, you know uh, iraqi jews to this day themselves talk about how um uh, the zionist movement actually um uh, um uh, you know encouraged um uh, uh, the iraqi government to kick out the iraqi jews um um so uh, so, so then you, you have all of these other Jewish populations coming into Israel, and of course there they faced all sorts of racism that they still face today, the Mizrahi Jews um, uh, uh, from the uh, Ashkenazi European Jews, which, you know, that form of racism is still exists today. But, but regardless of that form of racism, the foundational racism that shapes Zionist ideology from the beginning, like I said, is a dehumanizing form of racialization against the Palestinians. The Palestinians were viewed as irrelevant to the story. Their aspirations, what they wanted, you know, what their rights were, were not really at all considered uh, to be part of the, the conversation. And the Zionist movement believed that they could just go in and through sheer force, eliminate these people, uh, eliminate the Palestinian people. And, and who cares? Let them, you know, uh, let them cry and uh, scream and shout about their rights and all of that. They're, they're the backwards orient. Um, and as far as the Zionist movement was concerned, they had the support of the British Empire and later the United States, but basically Western Europe and North America, Western imperialism. And that's all that mattered because that's the civilized world. And what the civilized world wanted, the civilized world got. Um, and and uh, that, that, again, those dynamics are still present with us today. But, you know, without them, there could have never been a creation of the Israeli state. The Israeli state does not come into uh, existence without British imperial support. Um, and, and now cannot do what it's doing now without American imperial support. So um, uh, 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 the, the Israeli state now was created in 1948, but of course it doesn't take over the entire territory and Palestinians remain. Like I said, about 55% uh, were expelled, but so that left about 45% uh, men remain on their lands through armed resistance. Um, um, and... Um, uh, um, uh, so, so a, a, a portion of Palestinians also remained in the land that became Israel. They make up about twenty percent of the of the population in Israel uh, as second class citizens, uh, which didn't happen. You know that citizenship doesn't come right away. It took decades, uh, but but even to till today, they are second class citizens. I mean, you you see it today. Many of them are being arrested <laughs> without any real um, uh, due process or any rights or protections from the law. Uh, someone just posting something, anything, a flag, a Palestinian flag, they could be arrested or, or sharing an article or, or whatever. So uh, they can't buy land as easily as Jewish uh, uh, citizens. Um, you know, the, the, the list is quite long. And, and then, uh, uh, so, and then Palestinians and other lands. Now, D David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist movement, um, the most prominent leader of the Zionist movement leading up to 1948 and the first prime minister of Israel, you know, pr probably the most important uh, figure within the history of Zionism in Israel. Um, he used the language of, well, we didn't get the whole thing, but we're going to get this thing done by stages. We get it done by stages. We can't take it at all, all at once due to, a, you know, first of all, the resistance of the of the Palestinians and their uh, and their Arab allies um, and and international pressure. Um, um, so so Zionism never got off that path. It never viewed 48 as the final settlement of anything. Uh, they wanted the whole thing from the beginning, and this is what they still want today. So, you know, we fast forward to 1967, and that's when they colonized the rest of it uh, and, and start the occupation of the West Bank, uh, uh, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. And 
that has not stopped. <laughs> um, and in fact, what we've seen throughout all of those decades is the expansion of Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, of course, they pulled out of the Gaza Strip, but that, as, as many Palestinian scholars uh, pointed out at the time and, and, and since, uh, that dis quote unquote disengagement plan from the Gaza Strip never meant that the occupation ended there. Uh, they viewed it as, again, a temporary solution to a problem that they couldn't contain at the time, which was very strong Palestinian resistance um, uh, to Israeli um, uh, occupation and settler colonialism. Um, and, and, and they basically walled it and created the siege over Gaza. And, and so this has been the siege that has been in place. Uh, as soon as Hamas won the elections, that was the pretext they needed to, to create a total uh, uh, blockade of, of Gaza. Well, it was we thought it was total, but they went a whole other level of total now. Um, um, uh, and, and, and that's been in place since 2007, uh, I believe. Sorry, the date might be uh, off a year, but I think it was 2007. Um, uh, anyway, easily Googleable. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and, and yeah, so, so there, there was complete denial of, of Palestinian rights. Uh, th this is where you have the entrenchment of the system of apartheid. And it's important to understand the system of apartheid that basically, um, uh, you know, to put it very simply, two systems of rule, one for Israeli Jews, one for the Palestinians, one is, uh, uh, you know, democratic, people are protected from the state, da, 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 and the other one is fascist, just to put it bluntly, they can do anything they want at any they want, and there are no consequences. Um, uh, so, so they've been suffocating Palestinian life um, um, uh, for, for decades, um, uh, trying to uh, basically destroy the Palestinians' will to resist. Um, and, and, and let me now sort of shift focus to that Palestinian resistance. Um, uh, because that's a critical part of the story that is never told in places like the U.S., which is a staunch ally, of course, of the of of, of Israel, because the U.S. sees it as it's a critical imperial outpost in the region, um, uh, just as the British Empire did. Um, uh, so, Palestinian resistance has been going on for over a hundred years, from the very beginning, um, and it has taken many different sh shapes and forms: resistance to armed resistance, uh, to a combination of the two. Um, Palestinians have used, you know, labor strikes, have used um, uh, hunger strikes, have used, um, uh, you know, political campaigning and advocacy uh, uh, overseas in Palestine. Um, they've used, um, they tried to use legal action. Um, uh, you know, they've, tried, like I said, armed resistance as well. Uh, so, so there's been a whole host of, of, of um, forms of resistance that the Palestinians have undertaken to hold on to their land and, and to re try to reclaim their land and the right to return to their lands. Um, one of, I think, the most um, uh, extraordinary uh, examples of Palestinian uh, resistance comes in the first Intifada. Um, oh, I, I know, I just said the Intifada word, uh, which I know is very dangerous now uh, by the uh, considered by the Zionist lobby, which is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, uh, Intifada is uprising. It's a people's uprising. It's a shaking off of the occupation. And this, uh, the first Intifada was 1987 to 1993. Uh, you know, I was a child in Jerusalem during that time, and that was kind of my political awakening to the world at a very young age. Um, but it was quite an extraordinary event and nothing like the nonsense that you hear in public discourse uh, in Canada or the US about it. And it was, like I said, a people's movement. And one of the most extraordinary aspects of, of the First Intifada is the creation of what was called the Popular Committees. Um, now, uh, uh, what the uh, uh, Israeli occupation had done is, uh, since 67, is create uh, municipal committees to run the affairs of Palestinian, you know, health, education, that sort of thing. Um, and these committees were basically, you know, if you've read Mamdani's decentralized despotism <laughs> and how that was worked out in Africa, it was very similar to that. They try to make uh, strong men, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the leaders in these municipal committees and, and, and to rule over the people with an iron fist and just make them, you know, keep quiet and not resist the Israeli occupation and they get their cultural autonomy, quote unquote. That was basically the idea. Of course, the people didn't buy it and they knew what it was about. Uh, so the first thing that these popular committees do was completely eliminate all of these municipal committees and replace them. 
and um, they, they took over all of the functions of the sovereign. So whether you're talking about healthcare, food, um, uh, community safety, education, uh, cleaning the streets, you know, everything, everything. They, they were, these committees were made up by the people in their neighborhoods and they were like, okay, well, how do we take care of our community with, like with our skill set? Okay. This person's a nurse. Okay. Well, we'll use you for healthcare. And then this, well, we'll not use you, sorry, call on you for healthcare. And you're, you're an educator. Okay. Well, the Intifada shut down all the schools. So why don't you go and teach the kids in the, out in the field? Uh, that sort of thing. And, 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 they were extremely democratic, more democratic than anything I've ever seen in Canada, the US, the UK, or anywhere else. These were completely run by the people. And uh, uh, the people participated in all the critical things. And moreover, even when a leadership emerges out of these committees, um, the United Leadership, I can't remember the full title of it, of the, of the popular committees, um, it was made up from really the representatives of those committees but, but the, the leadership never became separated from the communities. And, and it never tried to give them orders. In fact, if you read the communiques of the leadership, which were important because that's how they all their, uh, shared the word with each other. If you read those communiques, they never give orders to the, com to the committees, to the local committees. In fact, they keep all the power in the committees and they consistently, over the couple of years that they existed, uh, consistently told people, listen to your local committee in terms of action to take because they also organized public protests and demonstrations and, and uh, strikes and all of those sorts of things during the uprising. So um, uh, uh, the, the power, like if you are looking for people power, this is, this is the perfect, the popular committees was a perfect example of it. And it's not just people power, but people's governance of themselves. Um, I mean, these, these, these committees lasted quite a long time and they terrified the Israeli state. And it was none other than the so-called peacemaker Yitzhak Rabin um, who criminalized them at the time because the Israeli state viewed these committees as more dangerous than any form of Palestinian resistance. And they were basically saying, you know, they just created an alternative system of government. They just created a state doing that, in a sense. And we can't have that. <laughs> we don't want these people to self-govern and to be sovereign. Uh, so these are considered extremely dangerous uh, for the Israeli state because the Israeli state is built on the settler colonial idea that only the settler colonial is sovereign, that they have to have this indivisible absolute sovereignty over the entire land and the people, and there cannot be any other sovereign that exists, just like the U.S. and Canada all other settler colonies when it comes to indigenous sovereignty. They don't, they, they, they will, the big no-no, you know, Canada's going on about reconciliation and all that. Mention real sovereignty to any Canadian politician. I don't care how progressive to the left they are. And they go, eh, well, okay, let's, let's, let's back up on that one, right? Because settler colonies by definition cannot tolerate indigenous sovereignty. Same thing here. And, and, and so they criminalize them. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that, that was effective. And there were other reasons why they uh, also started to fall apart a little bit, but that was the big one. Uh, because as soon as they were criminalized, you know, people started to get arrested. Some people decided to fight back. Um, so, so now it turns into a little bit of more uh, 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 armed resistance, which means you can't have everybody involved anymore. The second you go into armed resistance, you got to go underground more. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, these are these are uh, other questions that if people are interested, we can get into about like the 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 you know what happens usually when you when you take up armed resistance. Um, uh, but but it just made it much more difficult to continue these forms of mobi forms of mobilization. So unfortunately, that form of criminalization worked. Um, um, and, and like I said, there were other reasons as well. But I mean, th this example shows you with th in in stark clarity why we talk about Palestine as a decolonial struggle and why we talk about Israel as a settler colonial struggle. Because the Palestinian struggle is decolonial precisely because it offers an alternative way of organizing social and political and economic life. A way that is an alternative to the world of colonial modernity. Israel replicates everything that we know colonial modernity has created. It replicates 
settler colonial sovereignty, that absolute indivisible sovereignty. It replicates a form of the, of the state where, you know, it's not real democracy. You know, people don't actually get to participate in their in their in their uh, governance of every, their everyday lives, um, uh, and in and in many other ways, uh, um, exclusive nationalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But not in not in these committees. When the Palestinian people decided and and had an opening to create their own modes of social and political organization, they didn't look anything like that. They look like real participatory democracy. They look like a sovereign relationship to the land that does not claim divisible absolute lordship over the land. Um, uh, uh, they, 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 it was a form of leadership that emerges that doesn't try to then give fascist dictatorial orders to the to the to the multitude. You know, so and it was precisely that that the Israeli state viewed as so threatening to its foundation. So what is its foundation then? Its foundation is colonial modernity. And there are many other examples like this that we can go through where you see in stark clarity the decolonization struggle of the Palestinians and the settler colonial uh, logic of Zionism in the Israeli state. And that's what we see intensified today. You can't make sense of the attack, the genocidal attack on the Gaza Strip, uh, the, the, the attacks, the, the, the extreme attacks on Palestinians in, the, in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, uh, Palestinians who are. Um, uh, class Israeli citizens as well, Palestinians in the diaspora. You can't understand any of those attacks as a liberal state trying to secure its, uh, you know, uh, ensure its security. Um, this is liberal Zionist nonsense that tries to speak this way. Um, I can talk more about liberal Zionism in the, in the Q&A because I think, I believe I'm running out of time here. So, um, but, but, but you can't make sense of it in those ways. Um, you can only make sense of this genocidal operation as an extension, well, not an extension, but as an intensification of an ongoing settler colonial project that always viewed its colonization of Palestine in stages. And uh, uh, October 7th gave the Israeli state the pretext it needed to launch into this operation and, and, and continue it continue with it today. And, and let's be very clear, their intention is to expel as many Palestinians as possible from the Gaza Strip, colonize that land, make it Israel, and make it you know now under exclusive Israeli Jewish sovereignty. That is their goal. Whether they can achieve that or not is, it, is still an open question. Uh, they have the capabilities to do so, um, uh, uh, so th these are terrifying times, and, and, and nobody really knows uh, where this is going to end and how it's going to end. Um, uh, but I will tell you this, even if it does end with the expulsion of more Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, the, the continued complete massacre of, of, of thousands of Palestinians, the, the, the turning of the Gaza Strip into uninhabitable land for Palestinians and then claiming it for Israeli Jewish sovereignty and then starting to build Israeli Jewish uh, settlements and so on, even if it does end in that vein. Um, first, if it does end in that vein, the West Bank is next, make no mistake. Uh, East Jerusalem is certainly already, you know, almost gone. Uh, and and, and these, as far as the Israelis are concerned, it's already under exclusive Israeli sovereignty. Um, uh, and, and, and they will continue until they get their dream of getting the whole piece of land with about 10 15, 20% maximum of the population being second-class Palestinians or uh, just occupied Palestinians without, without citizenship whatsoever. Um, but even if they do get that, the story will not end there. Because for over 100 years, Palestinians have refused to give up their right. They, they, the will to resist has not been defeated, including the will to resist of, of Palestinians in the diaspora, in exile, whether Palestinians in Jordan, in Lebanon, in, in Canada, in the US, in Australia, in Chile, no matter where you find Palestinians, they have not given up on their right to return. So, so the struggle will continue. Uh, there is no way that the Israeli state can actually achieve its settler colonial aim because the world, um, uh, uh, because the Palestinians, like so many around the world before them and Till today, are never going to just accept uh, uh, this co uh, colonial project as the as their destiny, as their fate. 
They will continue to fight. Look at indigenous communities here. Uh, they're, they're continuing to resist. They're continuing to insist on their sovereign rights. Um, and, and um, you know, that's how we have to understand uh, uh, the, the Palestinian struggle as a long-term struggle. I mean, I hope I hope it ends and we achieve liberation and equality and coexistence for all within my lifetime. But it will go on for hundreds of years if necessary. Um, and and uh, um, they're, they're really, you know, as Matt said in the beginning, sometimes these things change a lot quicker than you think and in, and in ways that you didn't think possible. And, and I totally agree with Matt that the only real option is BDS without political and economic isolation, the Israeli state will continue until it, until it does achieve its goal. But even then, again, that goal, will they think it's going to be over then, think again, that the resistance will continue. Um, and, and so if we want to prevent <laughs> this horrific wider war, um, then, then you have to choose BDS. There's, there are no other options. It's either all-out war will come one day, um, uh, 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 or economic and political isolation that 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 forces uh, the Israeli state to 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 dismantle settler colonialism to de-Zionize. There's, there's no path forward with Zionism. It's 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 colonial and racist root and stem. Uh, but there is there is a, a room for, of course, for Jewish existence on the land. There's no room for Zionist existence on the land because Zionist existence on the land means colonialism, settler colonialism, racism, dehumanization. Um, so so uh, de-Zionization can come about through a long process of, of economic and political isolation of the Israeli state and placing great pressure on it. Um, uh, so that has to be part of a larger anti-imperial strategy and an anti-imperial struggle against the US uh, and its allies like Canada. Um, uh, this world of colonial modernity has wrought de death and destruction for millions of people. And, and, and nobody will be free until we really dismantle this world of colonial modernity and reimagine our, our social, political, and economic worlds. And, and the Palestinian struggle is, 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 a, is a microcosm of this larger struggle. Uh, and I do think that if you do care uh, for anything that is anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-imperial, then you have to care about Palestine. And if you don't join the Palestinian struggle, then I'm sorry, you're not doing the other ones. You're not actually anti-colonial, you're not anti-racist, and you're not anti-imperialist. So I'll end it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And thank you so much, Kiki. Uh, we're gonna move into our uh, question and answer portion of the evening. I appreciate you both so much for sharing your work. I've learned quite a bit from it tonight. Um, you both spoke quite a bit on uh, above and below and just separation from either map making to systems of settler laws and apartheid um, and talked quite a bit about uh, how separation from and desecration of the land past and present has played into colonization. I was wondering if either of you could speak to what decolonial stewardship rather than ownership of land might look like or expand upon that. Thanks, Hamid. Decolonial stewardship of land. It begins with the recognition that humans are not superior to non-humans, that humans are not the owners of nature, that humans, that nature is not an object. It, it, it requires a, a true shift in a cosmovision and a metaphysics of relate, relationality of how do we relate to the other that's not me, to someone who is so different from me, to this plant, to this tree, soil, to someone so small, so, so much tinier than me, this microbe, real microbe, right? Like in our worlds, in the Maya world, in Mesoamerica, in many of our traditions in Native America, we understand that everything lives, everything is alive. And what that means is everything must be respected. And so what it entails for us to truly store the land means to recognize that, yes, we as animals and human beings are all animals, we're in the animal kingdom. And how that makes us different from plants is that we have to eat other life in order to live. 
plants make their own food with photosynthesis in the sun. But as animals, we have to have this ethical question of how do we live by having to eat other life? How do we do it so that we're in balance, so that we can respect all life as sustainable? So these are very profound ethical questions, ethical questions about life and death that we don't spend very much time on, especially under Western modernity. A lot of these things are just kind of assumed. You know, we don't have to be taught that there's an above and below. We we're, we're forced to practice it all of the time with, for example, in schools, we get ranked according to how intelligent we are, according to very, very narrow measures, A, B, C, D, F, right? Like, and there's always this ranking that makes it very difficult for us to, to develop ourselves and all of our beautiful differences. Like, depending on how you were talking about, like with the reorganization of life, like whose superpowers is what? How could we, with everyone's difference, create the society that in, that, that needs everyone's differences in order to be strong. So the idea of being strong because of differences, not in spite of our differences. So stewarding land requires a cosmovision that respects difference in the most radical way. How do I share the world with someone who is not me? And that is a principle for someone who is similar to me for someone who is very much not me, and also for me internally, the me, because we are not just one way, we have a lot of contradictions internally, right? It's understanding this I am we uh, of the Bantu people and all over Africa, understanding of the me as a collective. If I were to then summarize the response, it to steward the land, it requires that we understand each other as a greater collective not as the individual, the hyper-individual of Western modernity. 100% agree, agree with everything that Kiki said. And, and uh, this, um, uh, how you view land is how you view people. Uh, if you think that you are the Lord of the land and you objectify the land and you get to instrumentalize it to suit your interests, that's how you're gonna, well, that's exactly what you're gonna do to people. Because you know why? Because the land is life. So, so that's your view of life is that I'm, 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 I can be its Lord. So if, if that's your view of plants and animals and, and seas and, uh, you know, rivers and all that, that's, that's also going to be your view of people. Um, uh, uh, because again, that's, that, that's your view of life. And uh, let me, let me give you an example from Palestinian Falahin uh, uh, to speak to this as well. And, and I, and I sort of referenced this a little bit in, in my, in my presentation. So under the Ottomans, um, uh, the, so the Ottomans, empire um, uh, was more or less decentralized. So it didn't practice the kind of sovereignty that then we see with the sovereignty of the European empires. Now, it went through different stages where sometimes it was more centralized and sometimes less. And the more, it be, as it become more, you saw more resistance, by the way, because people were like, ah, I didn't sign up for this, including Palestinians. So the Ottoman Empire was like, we were fine with you just collecting a few things and okay, because you, you have more guns than us. But like, we're we're not you're not ruling us right like so so that was that was kind of the deal and and when when the ottomans overstepped that there was armed resistance um but so one of the uh, uh, sort of reforms that the ottoman empire did in the 1800s land reforms wanted more people to sign on you know official papers that they own these lands right uh, that they own they own their lands and a lot of the palestinian fallahin which is the overwhelming of the palestinian population like 80 to 90 percent of it at the time um they were like well first of all the land is owned communally no no individual owns it uh but even if there is like a leading clan or something like that that could put their name down they're like well i don't want to put my name down because now they're gonna they're gonna know i exist and they're gonna come and recruit me and make me go fight in their army or and or they're gonna pay me, make me pay, make me pay taxes to the ottomans and i don't want to do either of those things so sometimes they just put someone else's name on it um, and, and it was usually an absentee landlord that was actually also playing a game, unfortunately, on these on these uh, uh, and, 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 and actually then took ownership of the land in a capitalist way. Some of those were, were Arabs, some of them were Turks, and, and some were European and so on. But the Palestinian Falahin were like, whatever, it's just a pointless piece of paper that has a name on it. We're the real stewards of the land. We're the ones that know it. We're the ones that live on it. 
the land, you know, we understand its cycles. We respect it. We love it. Uh, it loves us back because of how we treat it. And, you know, that sort of thing, right? Like, so they were like, that's the real owner of the land, not whatever some official bureaucrat has written down in paper in, uh, that is now stored in Istanbul or wherever else. Um, uh, um, so it, it was not until, so, so the owners of lands were, were more or less like I said, absentee landlords that were capitalists that would be like, okay, the Falahin stay on it. And, and then, but then they would of course like collect, they were basically feudal lords. Uh, uh, and, and the Falahin were fine with that arrangement so long as they got to stay on their lands. And then when the Zionist organizations came and started buying land and kicking the Palestinian Falahin off the land, that's when they were like, something's wrong here. Um, uh, 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 I'm not okay with this owner <laughs> because they're kicking me off my land and replacing me with other uh, uh, people to come and live on it now. Uh, and then most of them were being moved to city slums and, and et cetera. Th those were the, the driving force behind the first uh, Arab revolt uh, against British uh, uh, colonialism and, and Zionist settler colonization. But that was the view of the uh, Palestinian Palestinian of, of, of land as stewards, that, that the only meaningful relationship was the one that they had, not the capitalist uh, notion of ownership. Thank you both so much for that. Um, my next question is, um, why does the occupying state of Israel require anti-Semitism to exist? And how can we reject the weaponization of anti-Semitism and our solidarity with Palestinian liberation? Did you want me to go first on that one, Kiki? Or Adelante, please. Yeah, it, just because I've I've written quite a lot on this, so um, uh, obviously, so first of all, the uh, white supremacy exists. It still poses a dangerous threat to uh, Jewish communities everywhere, and of course, other communities. Um, and and we do have all a shared struggle against white supremacy, uh, and that includes anti-Semitism. Um, uh, so, so that needs to be highlighted and fought against uh, everywhere it appears, and it is appearing everywhere, <laughs> uh, by the way, and spreading, right? So, um, uh, but unfortunately, the Israeli state is not really interested in that. The Israeli state is only interested in weaponizing anti-Semitism to conceal its, its crimes. Uh, and this strategy started in the 1970s, and it was under, you know, a labor government. I don't, I don't know if they were called labor at the time. They changed their party names like a thousand times uh, over there. Um, uh, but it was uh, Abay Iban. Uh, um, I might be mispronouncing his name, but anyway, um, he was the foreign minister in the 1970s. He started to say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and we need to make that become a new thing. Uh, and the Israeli state has been, you know, pushing that agenda since then. Uh, and it has intensified over the last couple of decades. You know, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, uh, working definition of anti-Semitism, all of that. You know, when you look at their definitions, they're all on Israel. Um, so, so clearly, it's just being used as a weapon to silence and critique the Palestinian, uh, sorry, uh, silence and ex expel the Palestinian critique of Zionism in Israel. And when I say the Palestinian critique, you know, I've written a few articles on this. Um, well, one journal article and a few other uh, pieces of writing on this more uh, more accessible uh, language, hopefully. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the Palestinian critique is the one that is based on the Palestinian experience of Zionism in Israel. Um, so it is, it is uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, many Palestinian communities and activists and scholars and artists are the ones pushing the Palestinian critique, but many others have also joined it and, and, and contributed to it uh, as well. Israelis and, and non-Palestinians and non-Israelis and so on. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it's based on the Palestinian experience. And just as Israel expels Palestinians from their land and seeks to erase them as political entities, as, as, a, as, a, as sovereign and free beings on their lands, they want to erase and eliminate their knowledge and their discourse. Uh, and, and that's uh, a big part of the uh, weaponization of anti-Semitism. And it, this has dangerous consequences, of course, for Palestinians, um, uh, but also for Jewish communities. Um, uh, which I've, again, talked about quite a lot uh, in other arenas, but very quickly, it dilutes anti-Semitism. Because most people look at this and go, you know, this nonsense that they're picking on now, the watermelon is now, you know, a big, uh, a big problem uh, 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 that is part of anti-Semitism. <laughs> um, uh, you know, most people look at that and go, this is nonsense. And, and it turns people off from hearing anything about anti-Semitism. So when you dilute it, people start to then have a knee-jerk reaction that all claims of anti-Semitism are not real. 
Well, that's dangerous because there are real cases of anti-Semitism. So, um, uh, you know, this is one of the many dangerous consequences of this strategy. Mm -hmm. In a historical, a deeper context of, um, of, let's say, maybe the metaphysics of modernity, of Western modernity, that's central to this is the it's it's a, it's understanding of difference in terms of ranking of superior and inferior. So there's a very uh, the strong pattern that exists in Western philosophy, Western political theory, Western um, uh, even spirituality from above is that there is an above and there's a below. So I, I call this the spirituality of empire that God just loves some and doesn't love others, right? And the haves and the have nots is how we taught it in the street and in our communities. The above and the below where it's people making their lives at the expense of others. It's not just living, it's having a structural position of power where the below is foundational. So for example, in the case of Israel-Palestine to create Israel, the foundation had to be Palestine. Um, it needed to, and it extracts too, even if it doesn't extract labor from Palestinians, it extracts from the land, it extracts, if we can call it labor, the, the beautiful work and creating that Palestinians and the land have, have, have created for millennia. That's extractive of the state of Israel. And so there's this conception of above and below. And at the same time, Europe, modern Europe has had in its metaphysics, this recognition that, um, or this, this impulse, let's say, this impulse that its contradictions need to be exported out and ignored. Somebody else can deal with them in order to maintain Europe as a peaceful place, quote unquote. So for example, with 1492, with the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, many, many Jews went to Palestine, living there for centuries before 1948, were exiles from the Iberian Peninsula. Others came to these lands and became colonizers. And that is understandable psychologically if you are living in an imperial world and you're trying to survive, the only option empire gives is to go above. You need to shift context and go find a below. And we were the below. These lands were the below. And this happened also with Muslims who were expelled or and peasants who had their lands enclosed by nascent capitalism. And as they were struggling for land, they were told by their landlords, their rulers, hey, look at those colonies over there. There's a lot of land over there. Why don't you go? Right. And so Europe exporting its problems out to others so that it can maintain this, this uh, semblance of peace. And this is international law. International law was created for Europe. There is a Europe and a non-Europe. Non-Europe is the place of lawlessness, of piracy. International law did not apply apply in on Europe until the creation of the United Nations. And that's a whole other conversation because that logic continues of the human and the non-human of the above and the below. So this, this question in rights is very flawed because it focuses on the human as the center of life rather than of life. Like where's the defense of life, right? There's just a defense of the human. And then the asterisk on that is, well, what kind of human? And so then this is where dehumanization comes in, racialization, is dehumanization. The phenotype is the marker. That's the secondary part. The essential, the essence of racism is dehumanization. So with Zionism, rather than Europe, the West, recognizing that it needs to confront major contradictions about itself, and, and we can use a Jewish question as a longstanding one, right? Rather than confronting that, the the dehumanization that they have to others who are not how they believe the standard of a human should be and and they've treated jews this way for centuries in europe rather than finally confronting that contradiction they exported out to palestine it was going to be exported out somewhere else anywhere else it ended up being palestine because there's so many different interests congeal the christian zionist interests and also the military base the quote unquote outposts of civilization in the face of quote unquote barbarism, right? This was all of these different interests. So because 
hatred of Jews by Europeans has not been addressed. Israel becomes the resolution for that, the supposed solution for that, but it requires anti-Semitism to continue existing in order for Israel to even have any legitimacy for the reason of its existence. So requires anti-Semitism, it's not there, Israel is not there to dissolve, to do a way to fight back anti-Semitism. It needs it as its foundation. That's that's what created it. And I just wanna, uh, for, you know, there's so much more to say, but I wanna say since we're on this question of racialization, um, living in Palestine and coming from the context here where I know uh, racialization in the United States very well, uh, I was confused at first because in Palestine, Palestinians and Israelis look the same to me. Like, I don't understand <laughs> who am I supposed to be mad at? Everybody looks the same. Um, of course, the vibe is very different when it's a soldier and it, like totally the vibe is different. But in terms of phenotype is what I mean. There's dehumanization here. But why aren't we talking about this as racism? You know, this is something with Palestine studies that... Um, I don't think Palestine studies in academia really knew what to do with it. Like I, I heard a lot that, no, this is not about race. This is about two national movements fighting. And for me, I was like, this is about, this is totally dehumanizing. But I think because we get caught up on phenotype, we miss what the essence of racialization is. And it is uh, marking some as more human than others or others as non-human or subhuman. So it's a very rich place. Um, the Palestinian resistance for us to really address all of the contradictions um, because they don't seem to match up a lot from what we're used to. But if we can get at what's similar, it's logic and practice. It's this, this worldview that assumes the world is just above and below rather than side by side, rather than power flowing with difference. Instead, difference has to be annihilated and we all have to, we're expected to assimilate into a standard, which is above. I'll leave it there. Thank you both so much. I'm, I'm learning quite a bit and really grateful to be in conversation with you. I have one more question before I move into um, asking for any final comments you may have, and that's, um, how does the liberal wing of Zionism provide cover for and advance the settler colonial conquest of Palestine? I'm happy to take that, Mahanid, if you'd like. The liberal wing. So liberalism, we can, uh, for, for purposes of, of my response, liberalism, the way that I use that term, is a talk about a set of principles about the nature of the world. And one of them is the, begins with the unit of the individual, of, a, of the individual subject. And it's also this question of rights. So that ends up kind of being the moral compass of something of whether it's good or bad is, well, is it legal or not? As if the law has already taken care of these ethical questions, right? So. Liberal Zionism, liberal Zionism is really dangerous because it's kind of like the smile, the, the happy face of genocide. It makes it so it confuses things. It talks, so it, it, it begins with his, history when a, a, a law was broken, not the entire structure of the state of Israel was created. Right. So a liberal Zionists usually like to talk about the two state solution where they maintain uh, Israel in the armistice lines of 1948. Um, and they don't like to recognize the root. So they're usually the ones that call us radical and very proudly a lot of us. Yeah, radical meaning root. That's exactly where we are. We want to get to the root and the liberal, the, the, the liberal notion, particularly and we see this with liberal Zionism. They don't like, to, they don't, they, they don't like the root. They like to talk just about the leaves <laughs> or the color of the tree, you know, uh, not about the entire structure. So that's why liberal Zionism is very dangerous because it blurs, it confuses. It's not 
and and I don't and I'm not sure that liberal Zionists themselves are clear on their positions. I do believe that for a lot of Israelis, of course, and a lot of Jews around the world, because they've been taught over these last few decades, especially, that no place is safe for Jews, right? They've actually been taught this, and it, we keep hearing this over and over. I saw a tweet from the German government saying, there is no place safe for Jews. Six million of them were killed. This was a German government tweeting this, like, you know, who killed them? Germany, right? Like, Oh, and, and why do they replicate this, right? And so then that really does something to people's psyche where they genuinely believe that there is no other place that they can live. And I think that understanding that uh, as a reality is important. And I can understand that as a reality to many of them if they believe, and I think it's because they believe that the world is only a dog eat dog world. You're either at the table or you're on the menu. You're either gonna be eaten or you have to eat, right? That there is no possibility outside. So it's a very scary position. So just to wrap up this question then of Zionism, liberal Zionism, what we're seeing right now from our Jewish relatives all over the world, and especially in the United States where Zionism has really hijacked a lot of Judaism is the split, which is really important. The split being made very, very forcefully about how there is a different kind of Judaism that, that, that maybe this is not Judaism, but that at least that the split is made kind of like with, with white supremacy. White supremacy when when we say white people, I like to capitalize the W on the white to talk about structurally white, like white, I'm the boss, like white as above, rather than just adjective white. And I learned this from Malcolm X in his last year when he talked about meeting the Algerian ambassador and he's phenotypically white, but he's a revolutionary. And so, you know, having to split up this, this recognition, well, there's white adjective and then there's white, I'm the boss of you, right? That that match up in the United States and other globally increasingly and, and anti-blackness globally as its negative corollary. So how do we split those up? How do we split structural position and just be adjectives? How can we just be our beautiful white, red, yellow, black adjectives, right? And, and, and I think that that question of structure is important and that's the liberal position does not want to go there. I don't know if it's because they're afraid or because they really believe it, but it's important to know they're very dangerous in the in, in not as individuals, but like as a as a collective, in that they um, seem to have a block from seeing that there's a below, there's a foundation to this whole world that has been created, and it's a foundation of blood. Yeah, uh, if people are interested, I, I did write a critique of liberal Zionism in Al Shabaka, uh, uh, so so I, I kind of go through it in in more detail there. Um, uh, but uh, and and including a critique of a liberal uh, Zionist organization uh, in the U.S. So, um, uh, but basically, it does just provide a veneer, <laughs> a cover for settler colonialism. It's like every other liberal colonial ideology. This it's not the first. The history of colonialism is full of all of liberals um and um uh, so they, they're just another another bunch of liberal colonialists <laughs> uh and and uh, basically they conceal um they don't accept that it was settler colonialism they actually many of them so there's a spectrum as well right like like any other political ideology there's people that are you know that, that that have different views on it but more or less they do believe like someone talking about israeli apartheid and settler colonialism is anti-semitic um is, so uh they they talk about the two-state solution but there's no actual you know there's no political movement in the israeli society or state for a two-state solution i mean this just they're they're extremely marginal I mean, the, the, the number of people in Israel who are anti-occupation is extremely small. The number of people who are for a two-state solution is also small. Um, uh, the overwhelming majority of Israelis support the geno genocidal operation against uh, uh, the people of Gaza. Um, um, uh, so, you, you know, th there's no real uh, uh, political force for them uh, within Israel anymore. So, so. Um, they really do just serve the purpose of convincing American audiences, Canadian audiences, UK audiences, and so on, that 
the Israeli uh, state is a, a liberal democracy and part of the um, uh, civilized world uh, and, uh, 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 you know, protects human rights and, and protects diversity and tolerance and the rule of law and all of these kinds of things that, that then Biden, you know, spews out in his speeches and, and sorry, but millions of Americans then will buy and will just accept as, as true. Well, I think less now uh, with people seeing a reality with their eyes and comparing it to the words of their politicians and going, something's not adding up here. So I think more and more people are, are seeing through this nonsense, but it's still a powerful ideology that still works. And that's what makes dangerous, as, as Kiki mentioned, is because it, it conceals reality. That's his job. That's, that's always been the job of liberalism, is to conceal reality, call it something other than what it actually is. Uh, and when you conceal uh, reality, you propagate it. It's that simple. When you conceal violence, you ensure its propagation. That, and that's what liberal Zionism does. And it's, uh, you know, I, 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 it's not, I'm not saying that, that liberal Zionists plan this out and, and they know that this is what we're doing. I'm sure most of them probably do believe what they say and, and all of that. But it, it, it's irrelevant to me what they actually believe, whether they're genuine or not. Is, is completely irrelevant. It's always about the effects of your discourse. That's the only thing that matters. What are the effects of your discourse? And the effect of liberal Zionist discourse is to conceal violence and therefore propagate it. Thank you both so much. I want to give you both a, 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 a brief chance to say any parting words um, before we leave here tonight. And Kiki, I'll start with you if you wanted to leave us with anything. A lot of gratitude for, for this encounter and what I'd like to take away from it. What I will take away from it is more about, I, I really love for us to, to learn more, like how we learned with Hamid and how we learn from Palestinians themselves about how to organize life. Like we all can figure it out, you know, and, and we have for a very, very long time that that there's this whole discourse that Palestinians don't exist because there wasn't a nation's Palestine. It's laughable if it didn't have so many detrimental effects in reality. There, you know, like history does not begin when Europeans say that we are a people, when the West says that we are a people. So we have, you know, we have this discourse in the United States since the fall, uh, since, uh, well, yeah, the fall of. When Europe's implosion uh, after the Second World War, the U.S. comes in as if it's a kinder empire because it didn't, quote unquote, call this traditionally the way that the British and the French. And so then it said on this, this it, it called it uh, development rather than using colonization. It used the word development and it used the word democracy in a really messed up way. And that discourse made it believe, made, it made, made, makes people believe, even itself believe that we were just waiting to be saved, that we didn't have any civilization, that we didn't have anything until the colonizers came. So what I wanna take away, what I'd love for us all to take away from this conversation of how important it is to look at the below. There's already a lot, a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom from our, from our histories today and also from our great grandparents, our grandparents, our parents, ourselves um, in thinking about uh, olive trees, I just saw a statistic that um, it's a little dated, it's a few years old, that it, it's been 800,000 olive trees that have been uprooted in Palestine with the state of Israel. Like, we don't talk about olive trees enough, you know, when we talk about them or when we hear about them. We hear about them in kind of like the framework of private property. But in Palestine, a tree is not private property. A, a tree is a family member. That was one of the, the the beautiful things that I that I learned while being in Palestine, and it made me sad that I had to go there to learn that. I I think it would be really great if we could learn more about this question of stewarding the land, because the context we're in is these active genocides, and it's also climate collapse. This is the context of that, right? How are we going to continue? living and defending life while we're trying to stop these genocides. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Kiki. Beautifully said. 
Um, look, uh, you know, obviously the, the, this is uh, an absolutely brutal and horrific um, moment that the Palestinian people are going through right now. And it, it is extremely difficult um, and continues to be difficult and will continue to be difficult for the foreseeable future, sadly. Um, um, but th this is no, no time for despair for us uh, uh, wherever we find ourselves. Um, unfortunately, this is not the first time that Palestinians have experienced such a, a horrific genocidal uh, uh, moment. Uh, there's also been the ongoing Nakba, the ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people. And unfortunately, this is not the first time that colonized people have experienced such forms of brutality. This has been going on for far too long, um, for over 500 years. Um, and uh, to... to colonize people across the world and across history, all uh, for the purpose of the one thing that this Euro-American colonial project has only ever stood for. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, it only stood for, for one thing, power and wealth. And it ain't fucking worth it. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and it's going to continue. Um, the, the, these colonial aspirations to, to lord over the world um, are, have not gone away. We, you see them right now. I mean, look at the United States. It, it sees a genocide and its response is this immediately sends aircraft carriers to ensure that it keeps going. And now attacking the one group that is trying to do something to stop it, the Yemenis. They, and, and they're willing to go to any war to continue their dominance, their, their world supremacy. Um, uh, um, so the, we're nowhere near the end of this. And, and if we're going to see the end of this, we're going to have to do something. <laughs> it's, it's not, we, we can't just sit around and wait for the empire to fall. Um, and if the, if the US empire falls and, and the, the logics remain intact, whoever replaces it will just do the same thing. So we've done nothing. Um, uh, uh, we have to we have to get this about uh, taking serious actions and having serious conversations about uh, radically transforming our world, and and there are no shortages of alternatives. There are alternatives you find in Palestine, in indigenous communities across Turtle Island, and uh, in, in 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 the Mayan civilization and. Um, uh, uh, you know, everywhere across the African continent, there, there's there's examples of alternative forms of social, political, and economic life everywhere. There's no shortages of alternatives. We just need to build them. And how do we build them? I, I only know of one way, economic pressure. And that's how the Bolivian revolution was successful. And the indigenous movement in Bolivia brought the economy to a standstill. That's it. You you stop the economy and the regime goes, well, <laughs> that's it. I can't go on. You bring them down to their knees very quickly. Um, uh, so, so uh, you know, BDS against Israel, 100%. But let's not stop there. <laughs> um, uh, you know, one of the wonderful things is that, you know, I hope this brings down Starbucks and McDonald's once and for all and every single multinational corporation. Why the heck are there Starbucks all over the world? No. Uh, there shouldn't be. Uh, I'm saying it right. Like there, there shouldn't be. <laughs> um, uh, that's th those are th that's one way of monopolizing money and 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 ruining people's lives in those countries. Um, uh, uh, I I want the local uh, Turkish couple to start their own coffee shop and people to go buy their coffee there, not not Starbucks. Um, uh, and and on and on, right? Like so so we need we need to have these uh, serious conversations about this radical change that will not come about uh, by the elites. They're not going to change it themselves, uh, and it will require people power on on a sustained level for 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 long periods of time. And I know that that's not easy, and that sounds impossible, but you, you can start doing it in your own localized ways, like some of you are, <laughs> and and continue to expand and 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 push your work and 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 um, and, and and hopefully that will eventually amalgamate into something uh, on, on more global scale. But it's it's not impossible to do global scale action. And in fact, I'll come back to the example of Starbucks. That's global scale action. It's not like 
groups in Kuwait and groups in Turkey got together and said, how do we get, how do we bring down their bottom line? They just, they all did. They all just said, well, boycott them. <laughs> um and 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 uh people here are doing that too um uh so so you know it's not impossible for people action to to to, to reach those global uh levels um not easy but not impossible so so let, let's all uh just uh, you know my final word is um palestine you, you, look it's 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 a losing cause right now but it's not a lost cause um, so continue to the struggle because we can't make it a lost cause. If it is a lost cause, then 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 we're all submitting our fate, our collective fate to, to this world of colonial modernity. And I find that personally unacceptable. Thank you so much, Anahana. Thank you so much, Kiki. Thank you to all of the organizers. Thank you to anybody who listened in tonight. Um, I will leave us uh, just by mentioning this is the first in a series of three discussions we're gonna be having in two weeks on Thursday, January 18th. We'll be talking about Gaza and genocidal executions, and then we'll be going on to talk about redefining solidarity. So you can find updates and links for those on our, our social media. And we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you all so much for tuning in and uh, giving your, your minds to Palestine. And together we can work to free it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.